So this is this last minute travel site. Let's depart from Boston. Next step. Okay, so I can go to New York. New York. That's the only red carpet ones. Um, all right, let's check this out. So, it's the Michelangelo Hotel. They suggest some shopping. Um, so we've booked the Michelangelo. Um, next step, I want to get to the airline part. The site keeps changing a bit. It's a problem with having all these Ars Digita programmers. Hey, this is actually kind of cool. This is now online in real time with the WorldSpan customer re reservation system. Okay, so this site is going to eventually come up with, you know, offering us Delta Airlines or something, which most of you have probably flown, so you can imagine what that's like. Um, but that Michelangelo Hotel, and I raise your hand if you've been to the Michelangelo Hotel in New York. I was worried that somebody might have actually been there. So nobody's been there. So it wouldn't have been nice to see what the other readers and other users of the site had to say about that hotel. I would certainly feel more comfortable spending, I think it was $1,300 on this trip. This isn't working so good. Hey, is anyone from the Site59 team here? <laughs> this is actually an RS Digital customer in addition to an ACS user. Huh. Well, we can recommend some other systems integrators. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably WorldSpan's fault. Blame the mainframe. Um, all right, let's compare that to Wine Access. So here's the site that Eve built, actually the woman holding the dog. Uh, who's from the New York or Pennsylvania area? Anyone? What's your zip code? 12452. They seem to have a lot of shops down there. OK, so here's retailers who deliver to your neighborhood. Let's look at, uh, I don't know, Columbus Wine and Spirits. That's the first one. OK, so here's something having to do with, there's a picture of the owner of the store. This is a site that aggregates inventories from hundreds of gourmet wine shops across the country. Uh, alcohol is unusual in the US and it's illegal to ship across state lines. So it's very important to find um, wine stores that are, in a practical matter, able to uh, be delivered. So what these recommendations are, I believe that these are wines, there's a huge database of millions of wine. How many in the database, Eve? Two million SKUs? A couple hundred thousand possible wines, but oftentimes they sell out nationwide. And any individual store won't have all that many on hand at once. <clears throat> so these are wines that other members have liked across the site, and that this store actually has in stock, based on talking to their point of sale system uh, last night at midnight or so. OK, so here you see a professional review you know, here's somebody who says this is fabulous. Uh, unfortunately, that's the only one he's rated. Here's somebody who's an expert. Here's a whole bunch of other stuff that he's rated so you can see what he's like. Anyway, you get a feel that there's, it's a little bit like being in the wine shop and being able to talk to other customers. So I think that that kind of social shopping and experience is going to be much more what people demand. Amazon figured this out a long time ago with the reader reviews. OK, the other thing that is sort of basic e-commerce 101 is keeping track of what customer has. So here's a site that we built with a couple folks who, oh, yeah, Gerald and Mike were sitting over there. So here's a site that we built with these guys. It was their idea. They actually built a little factory that could make custom cut pants, khakis only and only for men. Don't offer to remember any more passwords. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, so these pants are different. 
Welcome back, Philip Greenspan. That's the trivial thing of um, remembering who you are. But what if you remember what I bought? Actually, this is an, uh, yet another service built mostly by Eve. Oops. Sorry about that. Eve works hard for a Caltech person. <laughs> All right. So uh, here, the server keeps track of everything I've already ordered. We need a little audience, audience participation here. So, sir, which, uh, which pair am I wearing? Um, number eight. OK, so this is pair number eight, as indicated by the pair number eight label sewn into the garment, made for me. So I can say, all right, I want to get another pair sort of like this. So notice you guys don't see what a fat slob I've become. <laughs> Levi Strauss is not telling me, you know, you've got a 55-inch waist. It's saying this is the same waist as pair number six. The same. So you type in your waist and inseam to begin with and your weight. And then there's an Oracle PL SQL procedure that computes what your waist actually is, probably. <laughs> so even from the first pair, you're never wearing what you said your waist was. <laughs> Different way of dealing with a customer. All right, now we're going to see. Here's some JavaScript written by a Caltech PhD, Aurelius J. Prosca, PhD. So look at this. Dressy, casual, pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Let's change the color. This was a fun sight. Gerald can tell you all about the business. Gerald, Mike, you guys stand up, take a bow. This is your idea. <laughs> They're shy. All right, so again, we can say we'd like it an inch looser in the waist and proceed from there. So totally different way of shopping made possible only by the fact that it remembers uh, what I already have. Um, I don't know if I want to share the Toyota site. Probably not. Let's continue. Now back to that. <clears throat> All right, so that's e-commerce. The hyped word these days would be more like collaborative commerce. So what does that mean? Collaborative commerce, I think, can mean things like harnessing together the power that comes from having everybody on the same server. So if you look at GE Medical Systems, for example, um, they sell CAT scanners and MRI machines to hospitals. And they have a remote diagnostic service where they're pretty much constantly online with the scanners to figure out whether they're working or not. Um, they can aggregate all the information they pull back into a best practices database of here's what you should be doing with your scanner, here's what kind of throughput you should be getting. And then anybody who's underachieving under those benchmarks, they say, hey, uh, we'll come out and consult to you and help you run your machine better. So it's interesting, Caesar Brea, our, one of our Actually, he was our first refugee from Bain and company. He said, note, note which division GE's new CEO comes from. So the new CEO of GE was one of the people who figured this out. OK, so there's a Caltech spinoff called Cyrano Sciences that makes an artificial nose. You can put it in a factory and sniff around. And they have an interesting system they built with ours digital community system, uh, as it happens. Um, and they. Uh, Upload, they stream all the data up from all these sensors to one big server, which lets you do sort of trivial things like sit at a PC a thousand miles away and see what's happening in your plant. But more interestingly, it lets you do cross facility instrument calibration. So, for example, you can say, okay, well, the smell that you're smelling now, you know, that's very similar to, um, you know, smells that led to plant explosions or defects in processes at these other places. And you can also, they can also use it for sort of new science to figure out what their stuff works. Yeah, so this is Caesar's slide, actually. Perhaps you should 
Notify PR to exp expect complaints from the server at scorecard.org. I don't know. Most of you guys have probably seen the scorecard system we built years ago for environmental defense. OK. <clears throat> so how do you plan a collaborative commerce service? Um, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, what does each user have that the other users would, would find useful? So this isn't too different from you know, comments and bulletin boards on photo.net, but it requires you to think one level up, maybe, uh, if all the users are medical doctors and treating patients. You know, it, it may well need to be quite a bit more structured than just a B-board. <clears throat> how valuable would that information be, and how do we structure the interaction so we make sure we're collecting this from users in a way that's amenable to subsequent query? So collaboration is more than a B-board. Caesar always brings up, he loves this example of the binge matic during the dot-com movement, we actually met a guy <clears throat> who was building a system for the college market to advertise to college fraternities. And he had uh, <clears throat> an application very much like GE Medicals where um, you would type in how much you were drinking um, on your latest drinking binges if you were a fraternity guy. <laughs> and then uh, it would give you a benchmarking report of your drinking compared to fraternity uh, beer guzzlers at other universities. So uh, that was the binge matic He had a similar system for women. It was called the slut meter. <laughs> Very uh, creative fellow. Um, I guess, the, I mean, his service idea initially wasn't so bad. The idea was, you know, if you're traveling, you know, if you're a hard partying fraternity type and you're going to visit your Aunt Mabel in St. Louis, uh, and you're bored out of your wits, you could go back to the site and find fraternity parties going on at local universities. I don't know if he ever, uh, I don't know if that site's still up and running. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, let's talk about public online community. So this is the sort of the first step in the online community biz, and it's one where I know a little bit about, and some of the same lessons are applicable to corporate, corporate internet communities like knowledge management systems are sort of the same thing, although they tend to be a little bit easier because you have more control over the users and sort of more affinity among the users. All right, the first thing you need is magnet content authored by experts. <clears throat> so on photo.net, you know, you have to do a little bit of work, like, let's say I can write uh, <clears throat> an article on uh, Oh, where's that 35 millimeter camera system? This is what I mean about the bad information architecture. Whoops, it's gonna be here. 35 millimeter film camera. Building an SOR system. <clears throat> so I wrote about you know how you go about getting a camera and you start with a 50 millimeter lens and here are some example pictures. Hey, there's Eve. She really hates this picture because she was sick in London, in Ireland. All right, then uh, about halfway down the page, notice this, it's hard to see, the, oh, it's not so hard here. You can see the scroll bar. So what separates an online community from ordinary publishing is that more than half of your content comes from the readers. So this particular page happens to uh, embody that idea. Um, I said you shouldn't buy a Pentax camera or Minolta because you can't get a 28 millimeter, you can't get a perspective correction lens that'll let you take a picture of a tall building without the lines converging. You, know, you don't have to tilt the camera back, you can shift the lens up, look up at a building. So, Here's somebody who complains there is a currently available shift lens, and he's uploaded a picture of it to go with it. Generally good format for a needed section. Unfortunately, it has so many irritating errors left uncorrected for so long. So the only error that he's actually found is that I said that Pentax did not have a perspective correction lens and he has attached a photo, which got stuffed into my Oracle database, so I can't ignore it anymore, of a Pentax 28 millimeter perspective correction lens. <laughs> so I don't know if one error counts as so many. Anyway, you get the idea. 
We had that magnet content authored by, if not an expert, then somebody that people accept as an expert, i.e. me. <clears throat> and uh, we give the readers the ability to comment on that and share their experience. So that's a means of collaboration. And it could be as simple as what you just saw, inline comments on an article. You can also have a Q&A forum. So here in the Q&A forum, we saw one thread already. Notice that the old threads sort by, there's one I'd like to show, it's in black and white. This says, contrast this to, contrast this to the John Deere site that we saw. I say if you click on black and white, you're going to get 513 threads. So here's the question. <clears throat> if you go out to take a picture with black and white film on a sunny day, do you find that to your eye the sky looks blue and the clouds look white? But actually they're very similar intensities on film. So what you need is a red filter. And the red filter makes the blue sky dark and leaves the white clouds more or less unaffected. So here's a guy, Dean Franco, who bought himself a red filter and tried it, but it didn't work as he expected. So he asked the question on November 30th. Um, here's uh, an answer with a picture attached. Here's a bunch more answers. Same day, Dean, sounds like a matrix meter, blah, blah, blah. The point is that this guy, here's a sequence I did a while ago, just playing around, taking pictures of my airplane on a cloudy day. I have never done a study of whether photo.net readers are married or not, but I have a feeling that it's a lot of single guys. <laughs> so check this out, no filters. There's the airplane, there's the blue sky, there's the white cloud. Very hard to see the difference. With a red filter, the sky has been darkened quite nicely, but the airplane and the white clouds haven't been affected too much. So I expect, you know, Dean Dranko may have a hard time remembering, you know, whether this was, well, this doesn't have any extension here like all properly developed websites. So you can't tell whether it's, you know, Microsoft ASP or J2E or whatever. And in fact, we could change it out under, from underneath the users and they wouldn't have their bookmarks all break. But anyway, he doesn't care, if, even if we were advertising that with our URLs, he doesn't care whether this is implemented in Perl or Tickle or VB or Lisp or Java. He just remembers that he asked a question, he got his answers, his email box filled up with a bunch of uh, notifications from the server and uh, they'll probably come back to photo.net. All right, the third required element for a successful online community is the powerful facilities for browsing and searching the magnet content and the contributed content. Means of delegation of moderation. So one thing you can do is try to make it easy for one person. Fortunately, I have to register. So one thing that you want to do is make it very easy for one person on a new online community just to see everything that's happened on the site. So in the last seven days, there have been 49 new ads in the classifieds. That's got to be wrong. Oh, this is only from new users. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, on photo.net, it tends to be a little bit overwhelming to look at all submissions because some people have been using the site. They use the site every day. Um, so really, the problematic postings tend to come from the new users, the people who are new to the community and don't understand the norms. So here we've said, okay, here's the new user's chat messages, here's their neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor postings, here's their related links, birds of Sanibel, photographing birds. My friends are maintaining this too well, so unfortunately I can't find anything good to delete. Anyway, some comments on static pages, but we can see it all in one place if we want to edit it to fix a typo or delete it because it's not um, apropos to that page. We can do it right from this one page. So basically, it doesn't have to consume your life. You go to visit this one page once a week or whatever, and you've uh, moderated your online community all in one place. Eventually, you're going to run out of steam, though. So what we said is, let's make it easy to delegate moderation. So let's find the people who have posted 100 times on this bulletin board since last November. 
And I think that the people who are really active forum participants are natural choices for moderators because they really know the forum well, and they're coming to visit regularly anyway. So while they're visiting, they might as well also take the time to moderate. There's sites like Slashdot that sort of ask every user to moderate. There's only two of them, unfortunately. But uh, you get the idea. These are people that are probably good to ask for uh, moderation time. Um, so that's what, you know, a scalable online community. Usually the problems of scaling up the number of hits that your server can handle, those aren't very difficult. The problems are usually <coughs> human problems. Uh, if your site really takes off, how do you support it without having to build, you know, an AOL style customer service infrastructure? Means of identifying members who are imposing a burden on the community and changing their behavior or excluding them. So the sociologist would tell you that you have to be able to exclude people from your community, otherwise um, it gets out of control. So on a site like Photo.net, it's kind of tough. There are people with really radical points of view. They're just people who are rabidly anti-Leica. They hate seeing somebody go out and spend four times as much on a camera as they need to, you know, buying a Leica instead of an icon. And they're just difficult people to deal with. And there's one guy who's really into Minox, so he was claiming that in an 8 by 10 photo, you couldn't tell the difference between uh, an image taken with a minox, which produces a negative that's a quarter the size of 35 millimeter, versus an image taken with a view camera, which oh, right. produces uh, you know, an image, a negative that's as big as your hand. Uh, so how do you get rid of those people? I mean, there's a variety of technical things you can do. Uh, you know, one thing is you can make the site break when they're using it, <laughs> so that it's just really sluggish and slow and they go away. A cleverer technique, I think, is to take their content, put it in the database, but since every page in uh, most, in a really good website, almost every page is personalized anyway to some extent, why not just adjust your database queries so that you're only showing their postings to them? <laughs> so they just don't, you know, they don't see a lot of responses to it because nobody else has seen it. All right, the sixth element that I thought was the sixth element that I thought was essential, and I still think this is true, is means of software extension by community members themselves. This is where I think Microsoft is on the right track with .NET. If you look at the great online communities like Slashdot, <clears throat> they are written by people who aren't particularly good programmers, but they're very close to the users. They're actually part of the community. If you look at online communities that were written by kind of a priesthood of programmers, you know, who after a year delivered some big monolithic Java or C app or something, Usually it wasn't just what the users wanted and they could never get just what they wanted. Um, you really need some people, you need a programming environment where people can make upgrades and improvements and subtle changes to the site's uh, programming every couple weeks. And it's hard to do that without uh, some kind of scripting language or some kind of uh, fairly robust system that means you'll, you'll only break one page at a time. Um, so there's this thing, for those of you who are wondering what Ars Digital Community System is, it's sort of a uh, collection of open source components for building online communities that came out of photo.net originally, out of solving a real problem, and this now, in theory, represents a whole bunch of other applications as well, because it's been used for a lot of other sites. All right, so that's sort of communities 101. Let's talk about sort of more advanced community stuff. All right, so what does this mean? There's these sociologist guys. Amitai Etzioni is the most famous. He's at George Washington University. Um, I don't know, he's probably 70 years old or something, and he's been thinking about this stuff for, well, about what makes a good community for 50 years. So his theory is you need a web of affect-laden relationships among a group of individuals, um, relationships that crisscross and reinforce one another, rather than merely one-on-one -on -one or chain-like individual relationships. So he would say that a bunch of people using AOL Instant Messenger can't be an online, can't be a community because the relationships are all one-to-one. -one. Um, a measure of commitment to a set of shared values, norms, and meanings, and a shared history and identity in short to a particular culture. And then you need access. People have to be able to get to each other on a regular basis. So that's to have any kind of community um, let's look at a site that says it's community. This is one run by 
friend of mine actually down in Atlanta, Paul. He has a lot of big servers and stuff because they got a whole bunch of hits. So this is community.cnn.com. So it must be a community because it's got community right in the URL. <laughs> um, the election is usually one that's good. Okay, the Florida vote. That's going to be one that's good. All right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, nobody remembers anyway. Number of people chiding the Supreme Court. There's a lot of pretty technical law stuff here. Um, this is not quite what I'd hope to find, but basically if you come onto this site, you'll find that people aren't really talking to each other often. They agree on very little. If you look at the election ones, that you know, about half the people were Bush supporters and half the people were Gore supporters, and they didn't really agree on all that much. And they didn't seem to have formed much of a community, whereas on photo.net, for better or worse, the people who really disagreed violently with the way that we looked at photography, saying that it's not primarily an equipment-oriented thing, that you have to think about the, the light on your falling on your subject first, and the film that you're going to use, and the perspective. And, you know, at the end of the day, the camera itself is just a little box for holding the film. People who agreed with that aggregated around the site. People who didn't agree with that, they went away before they had a chance to um, contribute to the community. Whereas at CNN, they don't want to come out for Gore or for Bush explicitly, so they get all these people assembled on the site, and their very neutrality actually works against them. They can't actually have a community because their users don't really agree on anything except that they want to get news quickly. So uh, Etzioni would say that they're an aggregation, not a community. All right, a good community. Some bonds of affection, people trying to help each other rather than pure instrumentality. But then he says not too many bonds. He says that Japan is bad from a community point of view because people have no flexibility about what they can do and uh, that women in Western societies um, had that problem as well uh, in the old days. I guess some women here might say that's true too in the modern days as well. Um, exclusion, you can't bond with everybody so you have to exclude some. Um, Let's look at some of this. Let's look at greenspun.com, which is this little outsourced collaboration environment that I have set up some years ago. There's a large format photography forum on here. Um, I don't know. Let's find something. Uh, anyone built their own developing tank? Anyway, so here's a guy asking about if you built your own developing tank. Good luck whichever way you decide to go. Pretty cheap too. Bo, Bo, Kevin. You know, these people seem to like each other. They seem to want to help each other. Uh, they're not getting anything out of each other. Um, it's not just instrumentality. Um, so I think that's a pretty successful community, much more so than what you see at community.cnn.com. And partly because they have excluded people. They've effectively excluded anybody who's not interested in large format cameras. Those are the Ansel Adams type cameras where you put a cloth over your head. <clears throat> All right, so before we get into building an online community, you sort of have to ad address the issues that the average person will bring up and say, well, online community is bad for the following reasons. And they say it's anonymous. So it was anonymous. We saw that at AOL in the AOL Liza demonstration. We saw an example of an anonymous exchange. Um, there was that guy, in, well, his AOL screen name has been changed to 58, but he had some screen name that we don't really know whether that's his real name or not. And AOL Liza certainly, as we know, is not a real person. So AOL Liza was anonymous. She was inauthentic. She was a three-year-old Macintosh pretending to be uh, a human being. And uh, online is uncivil. People say that, you know, if you look at community.cnn.com, you see people calling each other pinheads. Uh, you voted for Gore. What kind of an idiot are you? I actually feel sorry for Gore now because, um, you know, basically in the old Greek, in the old, the old days of Greek morality, if your house burned down, you know, you said, oh, well, the gods are really fickle. They enjoy messing with us and laughing about it up there on Mount Olympus. But, you know, so now I guess I'll have to rebuild. But 
Then Christian morality came in, and when your house burned down, you had to think about, you know, what did I do to offend God? He burned my house down. He's this benevolent God. He loves me. So Gore is just like that. Gore was basically constantly, I don't know how this happens. Like when Michael Capuano wanted to quit his job as mayor of Somerville and go to Congress, in every campaign speech, he didn't say, you know, God wants me to be a congressman instead of a mayor. But Al Gore and George Bush, for that matter, too, they always said, you know, God wants me to be president. God wants me to be president in every speech. And now, you know, Al Gore is at home. Instead of saying, God, I got screwed by that ballot design and these machines, now he has to be at home saying, God hates me. God didn't want me to be president. <laughs> so anyway, those people aren't very civil to each other. You know, you voted for Gore, you're a pinhead. You voted for Bush, you're a pinhead. Um, so Etzioni actually has written this paper about face-to-face -face versus computer-mediated communities. And here it is. I'm going to hyperlink to it just so you see that it exists. Being proxied through Pakistan here. All right. Anyway, it's here. <clears throat> um, so Etzioni says, I'm summarizing his paper, the computer-mediated communities in some ways are better because you have much better access. You don't need to leave your house. You don't need to pick a time. You're not going to get mugged on the way to a meeting in your online community. Face-to-face um, -face is better in that they arise serendipitously from other activities. So for example, we have this class here. People can mill around in the uh, coffee area. They can talk to each other. You, know, you guys could form a little community here, or some subset of you could form a community here just serendipitously. And if we had this class you know, every week, and the same people kept coming every week, probably that's what would, ha that's what would happen. Face-to-face -face is aut automatically authenticated. You have a pretty good idea, looking at the person next to you, that you know, it is a human being and not a Perl script. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know what that person's age and sex is. Um, with CMC, you gotta work at it. So basically, the, comp the, the lessons from the sociologist is if you're building an online community, uh, except under very specialized circumstances, the last thing you want is anonymity. The last thing you want are screen names. Uh, and you can see this on photo.net. People use their real names and they're pretty careful about you know, developing and burnishing a reputation. They want to be known as a good source of advice, as a good photographer. Um, so Etzioni would say the more identified, authenticated, and accountable people are, the better the opportunity for building a community out of an aggregate. So let's go back to that photo.net exchange. It's down in here. Let's see how accountable that guy with the airplane is. Oh, let's see, where is it? Okay, so He's accountable because if we click on Daniel Taylor's name, we can see what he looks like. That helps a little bit, I guess. We can hunt him down. I'm registered, so I know his email address. And if we wait a little bit for the server, we'll find out everything that he's ever said on photo.net. So you know, if he previously said that you have to use Triax, if you don't use Triax, you'll never get a good black and white picture. But now he's pushing you know, Tmax or Ilford, uh, 400, then uh, you can call him on the carpet and say, well, why'd you change your mind without telling us, or why did you change your mind? Okay, so here he's answered about the EOS 3. He's talked about the Siconic light meter. He's uh, a man of more than a few words, <laughs> right up to a few days ago. Elton John, photography's friend or a nightmare? He posted this thread. Oh. Elton John is actually, if people ask, he's a big photography collector. He's one of the world's most important collectors of art photography. Anyway, people don't seem to like Elton John that much for whatever reason. All right. So uh, Daniel Taylor is accountable. Um, and I think that does make photo.net a better community. So CMC, computer-mediated community, is much better at supporting broadcast communication. Um, 
So my articles on photo.net are a good example of a broadcast and also some of the questions that can be in the form of a news article or a form of a broadcast. So everybody gets to read it and people can agree with it or disagree with it. And the stuff that gets agreed with becomes, uh, as Etzioni would say, stuff that forms and sustains shared bonds and values. Uh, it's a little bit different, though, than uh, a town meeting. So he says face-to-face -face is sometimes better because you get immediate audience feedback. So his suggestion is if you're building um, an online community, it might be nice to have some mechanism electronically to get the kind of feedback you get if you're standing up in front of the town council. You know, if you go to New Hampshire and you go to a town meeting and you start talking about how, you know, well, the reason New Hampshire sucks is because there's no income tax and you ought to be more like Massachusetts. And, you know, eventually you probably get a third of your way through your speech and you'd realize that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of sympathy for this point of view. And maybe you should modify what you were saying to this group. Um, which you wouldn't get on the web. If you post it on a you know, New Hampshire community site, you just keep typing and typing away about how great income tax was without realizing that you know, people up there didn't share your point of view. Um, this is, I think, a really important one. Face-to-face -face supports breakout and reassemble. You know, we can have a break. People can go meet in clumps, talk amongst themselves. Most uh, conferences seem to have sort of breakout groups where people talk. Um, on the web, people generally haven't had that. I'm actually trying to introduce that to photo.net. So for example, what would a breakout look like? Well, let's go back up to the forum. Whoa, those WYSI pull down menus are a little funny. Okay, so let's find a topic that's almost, that's worthy, about, dis worthy of discussion. There may not be any. Um, how do I know what kind of lighting? Okay, so lighting is a pretty broad topic. You could answer this guy directly. You could post something in the database, but then it'll be there forever. So there's pretty high threshold to posting something that you know is going to become part of your permanent record that everybody's going to see. Maybe it'd be nice to have a breakout group. There's a fair number of people online at photo.net in the evenings at least. So wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to have a, a button you could click here and go into a chat room where you could chat to all the other people who are looking at this issue and considering it and break out. So there's a couple ways to support chat. The RS Digital Community System actually has a chat module built in that we implemented. It's all Oracle based and lets you <clears throat> do kind of structured customer service and it's sort of nice. But I've come to believe that that's the wrong thing to use, that these days everybody has in instant messaging clients on their desktop. So I think it's better to come up with, say, an a AOL Instant Messenger now lets you have a chat room. So you can actually hyperlink people so they can click here and they're now in a little chat room that you've set up. And for a community like Futter.net with 25,000 user visits a day. Probably just one chat room is enough for everybody. Uh, so that would be breakout and reassemble. They can have a little, people can talk amongst themselves in the chat room, and then when they've come up with uh, a reasonable point of view or they've got the stupid questions out of the way, um, they can come back and post something that is gonna go into the database forever. Here's something that is really counterintuitive to computer programmers. So I always think that the faster the better. So photo.net, you know, the Ars Digital Community System is configurable to have postings get held in the database until they're approved by a moderator, but I've never used that feature on my own site. So I thought, well, if they say something really bad, you know, I'll catch it with an email alert or I'll eventually delete it. But, you know, for the moment, just let it go live and that'll foster the discussion if people can have an immediate exchange without having to wait for the moderator. So Etzioni says that the face-to-face -face, face -face communities don't work that way. For a lot of stuff where people are worried about the rule of the mob, they introduce artificial delays. There's nothing that says that it should take you know, 10 years to execute somebody or one year to elect a politician. But in the face-to-face -face world, people have decided that these kind of delays built into the systems actually lead to a better result. Um, so it might be worth, if you have people discussing a highly charged issue, you know, there, even within, say, a company intranet, it might be good to introduce some artificial delays to say, okay, you can type this thing now, but it's going to get held for a day. You're going to get an email alert. You have to come back and reread what you've written and actually approve it. And that might improve the quality of the discourse, which again, <clears throat> very few computer people, you know, we think, oh, okay, well, if we can do it in a hundredth of a second, you know, that's good, but we really should try to make sure that it gets down to a thousandth of a second. But actually in the real world, or the face-to-face -face world, people have gone totally the other way. There's no reason you couldn't have a murder trial and a hanging 
in a day. <laughs> but that's not how it works. Um, OK, best of both worlds. So for a whole bunch of things, Photo.net is an interesting example. I think it might work better if we had regular conferences in different parts of the country <clears throat> and users all met each other. So people discovered that, OK, well, you know, those Leica owners, they are wasting their money because the Nikon is just as good and it's a lot cheaper. But, you know, listen, he's a nice guy and he seems to be pretty rich, so he doesn't need to conserve money. And, you know, why should I be uh, angry with him for having wasted money on a Leica? Um, so Harvard, this is a college that's up the street in Cambridge, for those of you not familiar with it. Small school. Okay, so the guys at Harvard, um, they have concluded that distance learning by itself will never work, at least not to the Harvard standards. So what they're saying does work, and I think a lot of other schools have borne this out. You get people together for a weekend or for a week, face to face, they all meet each other, and they go off and have some distance learning experience and they come back. I don't know, Al, you're more up on the Sloan. Is Sloan also doing something like this? Yeah, so MIT's come to the same kind of conclusion, at least in the business school. For the engineering school, we don't bother. We, don't, we assume that if you're not on campus, you probably don't care. <laughs> but uh, these business schools, I guess, there's an unlimited demand for business education, which leads people into trying out innovative things. So I think that that's true. And actually, we have some experience with uh, Siemens. <clears throat> so we built this knowledge management system for 10,000 salespeople at Siemens. And uh, they're in 35 different countries. <clears throat> and they kept scheduling these training sessions. So they would have these training sessions in Portugal or South Africa or uh, somewhere in Asia for groups of these salespeople. And they would bring them all together and you know, as programmers, we thought this was ridiculous. You know, I can't these don't these people don't know how to use a web browser? Why do they need training? And it's only now that I realize that actually they weren't bringing them together for training. They just called it that. They were bringing them together so they could all meet each other. And when they saw each other's names and contributions on the site, that they would respond more eagerly to each other. So I think that the and that's been a very successful online community. The CEO of Siemens always talks about how it's helped them win these multi-billion-dollar orders and. Um, the funny thing is, he always says that we built this thing. He says, we built this share net system. I thought, hey, Tracy and I wrote every line of code in that thing. <laughs> At least the first version. So, but you know, when he says, we built this, they don't mean that you know, they wrote the code, because obviously that's too mechanical to be interesting. They meant that, well, we conceived the idea and hired some little programming grunts to make it happen. Good education. All right, making sure that users can find the discussion. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. We'll go to the site that Andrew and DVR and a couple other guys built for the World Bank. I think this is the URL. They're not launching it for another couple months, waiting to see if the world fixes itself. <laughs> no, I don't know. Anyway, so here's this World Bank. This might be the old one. Gateway-dev.rstitch.com. I think my point would be the same. Oh my god. This is really weirder and weirder. Okay. Um, well, so here's this global development gateway. It's written by the World Bank for all the people in the entire world interested in development issues. So as you see over here, there's arts, there's crafts, just like elementary school. There's HIV and AIDS, which we didn't have in Brookmont Elementary School back then. Insolvency law, indigenous knowledge, broad range of topics. So let's say you go down to um, food security. On development sites, you always pick the first link because you're sure that Something's happening there. OK, so there's seven new items in the news. Ask the community. You can see what people are talking about. Here's your guide. It's sort of a guided site with all kinds of links from within the World Bank and outside the World Bank of interesting stuff that's happening. And people can discuss this stuff. So you can see that um, there's a discussion about Mike Bonet thinks that this could work. 
uh, development side isn't very interesting, obviously. Okay, so what I said to them is uh, I didn't think that this was um, I didn't think this was the right thing for a young community. In other words, I wanted to come to this site and right on the home page, I wanted to see all the stuff that was being discussed. They said, no, that's impossible. That would never be the right thing because people who are interested in insolvency law probably aren't interested in arts, crafts, or food security. And people have very divergent interests and they're going to be annoyed if they see a whole bunch of discussion about stuff they're not interested in. And my counter to that was, well, people have wasted a lot of time on a lot of internet services that never caught on. They contribute to it and then the service dies. It'd be very comforting to them to see that a whole bunch of people were using the service right away and their contribution probably wouldn't be wasted because this is a sustainable community. So um, uh, they obviously, the issue hasn't been settled yet. Uh, I'm not sure where they're going to come down on it, but the example that I cite is Slashdot. So Slashdot's a very successful online community of people interested in technology. And one of the things about Slashdot is that you don't need to think or to click or to search to find the discussion. The discussion is right here. This is one bulletin board with topic, 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 topic. And then for any individual topic, um, professor describes unbreakable crypto system. Okay, so if we click on read more, we find all the comments related to this issue. So it's very, very easy in Slashdot to find the discussion. You may not be interested in this topic, but at least you're not going to be under the impression that you're all alone on this site. Um, let's look at photo.net. So in the early days of photo.net, we had one B board. This was it. And then we added a nature photography bulletin board. Then we brought the medium format digest mailing list community from England over onto the discussion forum system. So it's sort of good because if you're in nature photography, you don't have to be distracted by stuff about medium format heading to Montana in February. Filter for Yashika D, Hasselblad, Hasi 500C. But if you're interested in a whole bunch of these different topics, well, now you have to do about maybe eight mouse clicks to find the new questions on those topics. So we thought, well, maybe it'd be better to have a unified presentation, and this is part of standard ACS, where you get to see, here's a, top, here's a posting from the Photo Critique Bulletin Board, Here's one from Medium Format Digest. And they're distinguished by colors and icons. We obviously haven't broken any new grounds in graphic design here, but you know, it's more of a programming exercise than anything else. And it, we can customize it. So I can say, well, I'm really not interested in ever seeing anything in the general not archive Q&A forum. And I'm really not that interested in video. So now let's update that and uh, we can go back and presumably this has been filtered out a little bit more. <clears throat> so I now believe that this ought to be the default presentation of the discussion on photo.net and then let people, if they're feeling overwhelmed and they keep seeing stuff about nature photography that doesn't interest in them or if they have an icon and they keep seeing all the stuff about medium format cameras that doesn't interest them, let them filter it out. But at least let them see from day one that uh, there's a vibrant discussion going on. So how can the World Bank use this? Well, they don't really have a discussion forum so much as comments on articles, but there's no technical reason why they couldn't build a page like this showing all the comments on all the items in the database in one place and have that pretty prominently linked. Maybe that would be the front page of the site. Everybody has an online community now. You can't impress anybody by saying, I have an online community, because they say, you know, my grandmother has an online community at Yahoo Clubs. <laughs> but we can still talk about refinements. And some online communities take off and some don't. So what's the difference? OK, one difference is rewarding users for participation. So let me show you the Siemens ShareNet system that we built. This is the development server. It's outside their firewall, so it doesn't have any interesting content, but it has some of the same software. 
<sighs> okay, so basically there's urgent requests. I'd see up here if some other salesperson in a different part of the world had asked a question. Let me just introduce you a little bit to the idea of knowledge management. There's no blackboard here, unfortunately, but you might ask why it's interesting. <clears throat> and uh, it has kind of a bad name because most people associate knowledge management with you know, some really horrific Lotus Notes system that's cumbersome and filled with crud. But you know, at its best, <clears throat> I think what knowledge management system is all about is you have a, Siemens is a big company. This division that we were installing the system for had $20 billion a year in sales of telephone switches, uh, which seemed like a lot of money because I never wanted to buy a telephone. I never wanted to buy a telephone switch, <laughs> but I guess there's other people there who, who do want to buy telephone switches. And it's in 35 countries, so basically they have this big hierarchy. And uh, you know, if you can be responsible for Latin America, and then somebody who's responsible for Argentina reports to you, and then there's a salesperson in Buenos Aires who tries to sell switches to the local phone company. Um, so you have this big hierarchy, and let's say you were doing a bid in Malaysia. And it turns out that it's a very similar new wireless system to what was just installed successfully in Argentina. If you want to talk to that salesperson or find out uh, what your counterpart in a different country is up to, <clears throat> generally the request and the communication has to go all the way back to the head office in Munich. Uh, so up to Munich and then back down the tree. So there's a couple alternatives. One is you could you know, get some management book about how a flatter organization is better and just you know, cut these people out of the middle and flatten the hierarchy. But with 10,000 salespeople, that might be kind of chaotic. So we said, well, we need to keep this hierarchy so that we have accountability for revenue and meeting targets and so forth. But at the same time, we want to give the salespeople access to each other. And we want to make sure that somebody who asks a question in Buenos Aires can get it answered by somebody in Malaysia. And that's what ShareNet fundamentally is about, is facilitating communication among the leaf nodes of this tree without tearing down the tree. Um, so there's a couple things. One thing that we built was a very structured way of describing a sales project. These are all bogus ones, but if you say, uh, I don't know, show me the turnkey projects. Uh, there's Lars Potar selling potatoes to the French. Um, I can say I want to be alerted of changes to this object, so get an email alert when something changes. And there's a list of contacts, so this salesperson can keep his contacts private, but I can ask the owner for permission. There's links to functional solution components. We spent a lot of time programming this site. Um, well, Chase and I, anyway, spent six weeks on this project, and we never did figure out what a functional solution component was. But fortunately, we didn't need to. All the code was automatically generated, actually. It's an interesting story that um, they had a very structured way of wanting to do authoring and editing and approval. And we didn't really, we thought it was kind of cumbersome. So we made them basically write down in a machine readable form what they wanted the site to do. We wrote a computer program to generate the SQL data model and all the web scripts. And then we showed it to them. Oh, because they only had six weeks to do it. They'd hired a web development firm, and they'd spent six months floundering around and hadn't produced anything. So they were behind schedule in terms of their commitment to the organization. So we wrote this computer program to write the computer program because we had a feeling that they might not like the results. So we showed it to them, and they said, you know, this is the worst information system we've ever seen in our lives. And, you know, we're a seaman, so we've been building information systems for 30 years. So we've seen a lot of really sucky ones. <laughs> <coughs> so... <laughs> We said, uh, well, how do you compare it to your specification? And they said, oh, it exactly meets the specification that you know, Boston Consulting Group and we developed. We said, OK, well, what do you infer from that? So they changed the spec. We ran the program again. The system that was then running was a little better. Uh, they made some more refinements. And then we finally launched the third system, which is more or less what's happened at Photo.net. It's just that at Photo.net, that process you know, has allowed has been able to take six years, whereas it seemed as they had to go through it all in six weeks. So this kind of automatic code generation was the only way to deal with it. So it was interesting for that reason. We came to appreciate, actually, the thought that Siemens and Boston Consulting Group put into it, because they thought, first of all, about building the face-to-face -face community by bringing people together in these uh, training workshops. Secondly, 
if I say that I've reused, if I say that I've reused that project, I get some points. And also the person who give reuse feedback. Um, the person who wrote the bit of knowledge gets points. And then even in the discussion forum, you get points for posting a question, for uh, answering a question. So here's my share statement. I have answered two urgent requests, giving me 16 shares. I've posted six responses to regular questions, 24. I've published one object. And I got 100 shares for welcome to ShareNet. <clears throat> so basically, if you score high on this point system, um, the, uh, the old system, they said if you're among the top scorers, you get a free trip to Hawaii. You get to hang out in Hawaii for a week at the ShareNet sales conference with the 50 other top salespeople. And the second prize was you know, two weeks in Hawaii with those 50 salespeople. <laughs> so, but the idea was that they had these nice rewards and they monitored, they gave you points for what they wanted you to do on the site. And it worked very, very well. This community took off very quickly. Uh, again, partly it's easier when you have 10,000 people and you can just tell them what to do. But any of you guys here have ever managed an organization, you probably have learned that just telling people to do something doesn't always mean that they will do it. Okay, what about Amazon? <clears throat> these guys are always uh, a good source for smart ideas. So let's look at a product. Uh, what's that guy's name? Raskin. So you know that Amazon has book reviews. So here's a book, Humane Interface, The New Directions for Designing Interactive Systems. And here's a review from Portugal, everybody should read it. Practical, insightful, leap forward. Forgettable and ineffective. Some sourpuss <laughs> from Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I got annoyed because Amazon recommended this book to me, and I remembered that I'd actually, somebody, somebody a professor from Australia suggested that I uh, refer my students to a few pages in the middle of this book, and I said, well, I've never seen that book. So we had this whole conversation, and. Um, a day later, I looked around on my bookshelf and I noticed that I had the book. Not only did I have the book, but I'd read it and I'd completely forgotten. You know, the ideas were so similar to ones that you, I, people, just, you know, there's a market for curmudgeonry, like, Windows sucks, it's too complicated. You know, if I just say that enough, I guess I can go on the lecture circuit, I can write a book about how much Windows sucks. Um, but it's really, nothing's, nothing's very new about that. So this book wasn't very new and I put a little review in. Um, so actually, I made the point that you know all these books on usability, they're not actually usable. I mean, think about it. A hard copy book on usability. The people who, if you if you want to write a novel, you know, a novel is a great thing for a hard copy book because you can sit down in your airplane seat, you start reading at page one, you read to the end, and then you give the book to the flight attendant. Um, you probably don't want to read it again, unless you're a literature scholar, in which case actually. Um, most works of literature are now available electronically. There's all kinds of websites with important classics and so forth. So basically, technical books are different, though. Usually, most people, including me, apparently, are pretty obtuse. If you read a technical book, you may forget most of what you read. You have to go read it again. You have to read it in sections. You have to find the stuff that's really important to you right now. With students at MIT, you know, we don't like to assign 17 books at the beginning of the term. I mean, the tuition's bad enough. We don't want to say, okay, by the way, students, you have to fill up your dorm room with 17 books, hard copy books per course, because we want you to read these little pieces of each one. It just isn't going to happen. Maybe we'll assign a textbook. Well, if, if a book can be a textbook for a full semester course, perhaps we would assign it. But in general, more and more courses are getting away from textbooks altogether. There's a lot of courses at MIT where everything's online. So all these guys who keep writing about web usability in these books about how you know, computers need to be more usable, if they thought about it, they would realize that their book is completely unusable, and the probability that the people who most need to encounter it, like engineering students at universities, is almost zero, because it's not um, comprehensive enough to be the textbook for a full semester. And uh, a faculty member who wants a student to see five pages of their book isn't going to take the trouble anymore, because people in universities are really lazy to you know, make a bunch of copies and hand them out. So 
probably they'll find some competitive source of information on the web. If there's an adequate thing on the web, they'll just stick the URL on the course website and say, hey, go look over there. So anyway, that's a sort of a pet peeve of mine, all these books about usability that aren't available in web editions where people can just link to them. Apple actually gets it right. There's a book called The Macintosh Human Interface Guidelines that is available on the web. And I do actually reference it. I tell my students to all go read it. I don't know if they ever do, though. We find out on the exams. Hey, what was that? Um, refresh help. Let's go out of this page view mode so I can actually use the browser. Um, oh yeah, there was a point to this whole long-winded diatribe. The point is, look at that. Top 1,000 reviewer. So this showed up on the Amazon page last fall. I thought, well, that's strange. How did I get to be a top 1,000 reviewer? So I said, let's see more about me. <clears throat> and I saw reviewer rank was 923. So I was just barely in the top 1,000. And I got all panicky. <laughs> I don't even really like Amazon that much. They've done some pretty evil things. They went and patented one-click ordering, which I developed one afternoon for MIT Press about five years ago. And then two years afterwards, they were able to patent it because you know, people say, Philip, why didn't you patent it first? And I say, well, I don't really, I don't usually go down, running down to the patent office after an afternoon of hard work. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. Uh, but um, anyway, I got all freaked. I thought, you know, Philip, you haven't submitted any reviews to Amazon. So it turns out you get the reviews by feedback. So basically, two out of two people found this review helpful of the Barcelona guide that I just submitted. Um, one out of seven people found my Jeff Rask. I guess Jeff's friends are on here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the more votes you get from people who find your review helpful, the higher up you rise. And I was pretty high because um, you know, I started using Amazon seven years ago, so some of my early reviews, I guess, had racked up a fair number of positive reviews. So, you know, I'm so competitive. I don't really like these guys. They're not paying me. I, I would hope that I'd have better things to do with my life and my mental energy, but apparently not. I'm so <laughs> testosterone poisoned that I said, God damn it, I'm not going to let these other people crush me and beat me out of the top 1,000. So I went to my website. I have this uh, little book review page on my website some of you guys may have seen of books that I've read that I think are worth reading. So I went and cut and pasted all those frantically from my site into Amazon. And now I religiously, if I get off a plane, you know, I just run right over. The first thing I do when I get in the house is go and type in a little review at Amazon of the book I just read. Um, and so now I've uh, worked my way up to 722. But it's enormously, I mean, Napoleon said that people would die for medals but not for money. And I think it's Amazon figured that out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's brutal. Intel does it actually for employees. They rate everybody. They rate and rank everybody in the company, and you're never able to uh, <clears throat> labor under the illusion that you know uh, you're not the uh, that you are the best person in the company. They're always careful to show exactly where you are, and I think that's good in online communities. Also, it's a little bit brutal, but maybe it's a good idea to show people look. On the scale of contributions to photo.net, now what do we care about at photo.net? We probably care at photo.net about getting people, we don't really ask users this, but I think it's worth doing. If a user posts a question on photo.net and there's 100 answers, it'd probably be worth asking that user, which of these 100 answers really answered your question the best? Which of these are the most important? And giving those people points for closing out topics of concern um, or answering questions of users. And then just rank people and watch them compete to be uh, number one. So that's a little sick. <laughs> um, break out and reassemble, we talked about that already. Um, you can see who's online right now at photo.net. It'd be kind of fun to shout to all of them. Hey guys. What do you guys think about the latest Nikon? Nikon just released a new manual body. Um, before we go talking about the future, a woman here from Zipcar, actually she just left, but she was very interested in, so I don't know how many of you guys know about Zipcar. Uh, it's a system where you 
uh, rent a car by the minute or by the hour. So you sign up and then you can walk up to, you can reserve on the web that your car will be there in a particular parking spot. You get in the car, you drive somewhere else, then you leave it in another zip car space when you're done. So it's kind of a micro car rental service that takes the uh, transaction time out of renting a car and also gives you guaranteed parking spots. So we don't have to take it back to uh, where you rented it. So you don't have to keep taking it back to the airport. You can just rent it in Harvard Square and drive it uh, here to the Sinesta and then leave it in the zip car space. And uh, I guess if somebody else needs it, they go and uh, shuttle it elsewhere. So it's kind of a neat little service. And they want to have a discussion forum in community on their site, but they have this issue of, well, right now all of their users are in Boston, um, but they expect to grow to other cities. So some people may want to just talk about Zipcar and have a nationwide community and they're environmentalists and they want to talk about the environmental aspects of it. Other people may just want to talk about Beacon Hill. They use Zipcar and Beacon Hill. What are the issues with using Zipcar and Beacon Hill? So she said, how do you do that? And I said, the answer is geospatialization. So <clears throat> you say, well, what if you're in Massachusetts or in New England? You can, there's one discussion forum, and you could view this as a single discussion forum, a la photo.net. Or you could say, well, um, you know, I'm just in Massachusetts. I don't want to see anything unless it's in Massachusetts. And you can even limit, limit it by the county. So for example, you see discussion forum postings. And here's one about hood coding, hood coatings in Georgetown. And it's tagged to a page talking about this facility, how much pollution they're releasing. You can send them a fax right from the server. That's always fun. Dear folks, you get to edit it if you're logged in. This factory is like receiving those. Um, and uh, you can see where it is. Let's see if the mapper, I hope we're not firewalled here. You can see where it is. Here's a good UI principle. This mapper actually originally looked just like all the other mapping applications on the internet. So it was a little map surrounded by a forest of user interface and all kinds of options for things you could do to the map. And I said, Carl, this is an open source tool. Actually, you can get it off the rsdigital.com site. I said, Carl, just take a hint from the Macintosh world. Pick the object first and then have a little pop-up menu with the actions like zoom out. Let's pick the object first and then the verb. So get a report, zoom out farther. Anyway, you get the idea. So that's a little point from the uh, geospatialization is often the answer. <clears throat> All right, so the future. Let's talk about the future here, and then we'll take some questions. So what is the future? Well, as Jin Choi says, it's um, either heat death, cold death, or big crunch. So in uh, heat death, all the energy has dispersed from high potential energy regions to low potential energy regions, and we've reached maximum entropy. So we can't extract any more energy out of anything to do anything, so we'll all be dead. There's cold death. The universe keeps expanding, and eventually everything just cools down. So it's uh, awfully cold. Only Alex, the dog, would be happy. And then there's big crunch. So if the universe has enough mass, if we all keep eating, then uh, in fact, it'll all crunch back together. So that's a ways off. So in the meantime, what about the nearer future? So, OK. Um, network applications and simple appliances. You know, does Hannibal the Cannibal reinstall Windows? Probably not. Actually, I found out definitely not. Well, I, actually, if you're breaking the laptop in half, you might have to reinstall Windows. But <laughs> generally, uh, Anthony Hopkins didn't seem very interested in the current range of what you can do with a computer. And you know, is that because he's running Windows 98 and he should have been running Win2K or the Mac? I mean, I don't think so. The whole idea of what a computer is and the way the network, the way the file system works is just too annoying for most people. So there's some issues. Alan Cooper points some of these out with file systems. Fundamentally, the um, Hierarchical file system of organizing files into a tree of directories. That was introduced in the 1960s on mainframe computers when people noticed that if you had thousands of files in the file system, it was slow to find individual files. 
So they said, okay, well, if we organize this into a tree, the access time will grow as the logarithm of the number of files rather than the linear number of files. So every time we go down a directory tree, we're eliminating you know, 90% of the possible files to search for. So uh, when the Mac and the PC came out, the people who produced them just dumped these hierarchical folder-based file systems onto users without ever asking themselves, is this what people want? So if you look at the way people use computer applications, like uh, word processors, and you tell somebody to go edit this document. So let's say they double click on a letter, they edit it for a while on the word processor, they hit quit, and it says, well, do you want to save your work? And what are they supposed to make of that? I mean, how, why are they supposed to know that the computer has a storage hierarchy of cache memory, RAM, disk, and tape? Why doesn't the computer just keep track of versions? If they quit the word processor, then it creates, uh, or it's been continuously creating new versions of the document, and then you can go back and say, well, give me the latest version, give me what I had a week ago, give me what I had when I called it version, uh, when I called it, you know, final, final, double final version. <laughs> now, why should you have to manually uh, handle that in the file system? Why should you have to characterize everything in one tree anyway? Why is that the right thing? The relational database management system doesn't make you do that. Why shouldn't you be able to say, look at all the files based on project, look at all the files based on um, what they're about? Okay, um, so that means simple appliances. So most of the time we'll be authoring for mobile phones, for TV sets, for little wall panels in your house, um, and most of the intelligence will be in the network. It's the network's job, a shudder to think about this given that I can't even get Sprint PCS coverage on the MIT campus, but uh, in theory, most of the intelligence should be with Sprint PCS or um, Verizon, since they provide the phone system to my house. You know, one of these people should keep track of my important files, um, how I can get to the heating system in my house to turn it on or off. Um, but I don't really want to do it myself. If you think about it, most of my friends have, uh, you know, they have a broadband internet connection coming into their house. They have an IP network address translating uh, router. They have a whole bunch of, P oh, and they have a IEEE 802.11 base station for wireless networking, and they have a few PCs around the house with Waveland cards. They can wander everywhere. It's all pretty cheap. It didn't cost any of them that much money, but it certainly required a lot more sophistication about how to set it up and configure it than the average consumer is going to want to deal with. So <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of, I think, research and product innovation around making this stuff really, really simple so that anybody who has an interest in this kind of capability can in fact um, make it happen even if <coughs> they don't have um, a lot of technical knowledge. Personalization. All right, so here's a typical internet site, another Ars Digita community system backed one. US law, banner ad. Navigation, ask a lawyer. Um, family law. Suggested reading. So basically, to me this is the, we have an Oracle database. Let's query everything out of it and put it all on one page, School of Web Design. And this is where more and more sites are getting. And it's kind of nice in a way. It actually uh, ties in pretty well to what Edward Tufte is talking about. You know, give people as many options as flat as possible all in one place. But it has kind of a pernicious interaction with the three or the four line displays of a mobile phone. You know, if you had to scroll down through all the stuff on a mobile phone, it would take you a long time. And what's really important? <clears throat> so personalization becomes a lot more critical, and I think there are some <laughs> ways that people are going to start attacking this. One way is with full text search engines. I keep meaning to make some student do this, but they keep dropping my course when I tell them to do it. Um, and um, one thing is just to, whenever people are looking at a document, be it a classified ad, a bulletin board posting, um, an article, ask them, do you like this or not? And one, eventually you have a database of all the stuff they've said they liked and all the stuff they said they didn't like. And when new information is posted on the site, 
<clears throat> you can compare it to everything they said they liked and everything they said they didn't like for maximum similarity and maximum dissimilarity, and the highest scoring things are now the ones that you want to promote to this user. So that, I think, gives you the opportunity to have a mobile phone and maybe get you know, the top three new things on the site that are most of interest to you. So that's something I'd like to try. The other thing that I think is interesting is shareable and portable sessions. So what does this mean? The web is supposed to be about a collaboration. What's the one thing that is almost impossible to share? Anybody? I could. Yeah, the browser. So unless you have special software and a lot of social agreement among your friends and you're all using the same kind of computer, it's very easy for me to share a file. I can upload the file to photo.net as an attachment and then tell you to download it. Um, it's very easy for me to share a picture, all kinds of places on the internet when I can do that. But it's very hard for me to share what I'm doing on the internet right now, which is actually really useful in a lot of contexts, like showing somebody how to do research, getting somebody to approve what I'm buying. A lot of these, <clears throat> some of the smarter e-tailer sites, I think, let you build up a shopping basket and then, actually Site59 does it. You can, you can say, I'm planning on taking this trip and you can email it to your friend and then your friend can look and see what you're planning to do and say yes or no, that's a good idea. But in general, it's kind of hard for your friend to just see what it is that you're up to. It becomes particularly impossible when your friend is on a WAP phone and you're on a, a Netscape browser. So I have a feeling that it'll be interesting to put more shareable sessions into the network. So right now there's some desktop tools that you can get that'll do this, but I have a feeling that it'd be nice if this were a standard feature of sites themselves. So I could connect to photo.net from whatever standard web browser and say, you know, I now have the authority somehow to pick up you know, what Eve Anderson is doing right now and then just get um, the uh, uh, results of her surfing around. I think the same infrastructure can be used for portability. So right now, if you're at work and you do a whole bunch of stuff on the web and then uh, you, know, you have to rush home for whatever reason, it's very hard to pick up where you were. So let's say you're stuck in traffic and you want to you know, finish your transaction, maybe finish confirming a posting or finish getting some information or finish buying something. It's actually sort of hard to do that from your uh, mobile phone and, uh, or from another computer, and I think it, it ought to be easy. <clears throat> okay, here's an overall research challenge, which I think is a rich... There's all these people who take long car rides, and I guess it's getting longer and longer. That's actually... A friend of mine was the campaign manager... A friend of a friend was campaign manager for the Michael Dukakis presidential campaign, which was a big hit here in Massachusetts. I guess a lot of people voted for him just to get him out of the state... <laughs> but uh, he, unfortunately, he was unfortunate enough to come over to my house one night and there were 10 people in a circle and he was talking about the big ideals and what he wanted to do and each of us just hammered on him and said, you know, the one thing that's wrong with America was X. So I, of course, said the one thing that was wrong with America is we need a public, free, wireless, medium bandwidth internet connection. That everybody, in, this was back in, well, whenever Dukakis was running, what was that, 88? So I said, I, want, I basically wanted 802.11b. In Aspen, actually, you can get this. Uh, Bill Joy from Sun has located there, and he's put an IEEE 802.11b network over in the entire city of Aspen. So wherever you are in Aspen, you can get pretty high-speed internet connectivity for free for the cost of a Waveland card or whatever. So I said, that's what <clears throat> we should have, and that would make the government, uh, that would make the economy move a lot faster. It would solve the problem of equal access. I mean, you couldn't have a T3 level of connection into your house, but at least you could you know, get email, get stuff off the web, all this stuff delivered to you know, poor people, rich people, whatever, um, centrally paid for. Um, so that was my pet desire, instead of you know, fixing crime or whatever Dukakis was talking about. And it went down the list. So each person had a totally different take and said, this is the one thing that's wrong with this. So, so my friend Gerard, who was working at the Center for Transportation Studies at MIT, he said, oh, this is crap. Americans don't care about any of the stuff that you're talking about in your campaign. The only thing Americans care about is urban traffic congestion. That's the number one thing that bothers Americans. And this was 88. It's gotten much worse since then. So people are going to be riding in their cars more and more often. And you have questions. You're talking to your friend about movies. Um, 
Wouldn't it be nice, as I said earlier, to be able to ask the car, you know, go and look up who played the psycho in Psycho. So I think it ties into some technologies like speech recognition systems that once they know what you're talking about roughly can do a pretty good job of recognizing speech and then having the car be connected obviously with a 3G wireless network starting I think in another month or two in Japan or in Tokyo I should say you'll be able to get 3G wireless. So that means you get um, 1.5 megabits if you're standing still and 144 kilobits of connectivity if you're driving around in a car and uh, I guess something in between if you're walking. So um, once you have that kind of network bandwidth then it becomes an issue of interface. I guess if you're a passenger in your car you can do a certain amount of typing and reading but otherwise the emphasis is going to shift to uh, voice control. All right so why are rich people so miserable? Um, oh actually that's the second. Well we'll talk about this. Why are rich people so miserable? You think that if they had three times as much income, they'd be three times as happy. But it turns out, I think one reason is, is they keep buying stuff. So they keep buying stuff and putting it in their house, having AV switching equipment and home networks. And eventually, they find that they're living with their AV consultant. <laughs> so the AV consultant is there constantly rebooting you know, their home automation systems. And they don't get much satisfaction out of this. Or they're trying to figure out the interface of their VCR. I actually have this, I have a fantastically expensive stereo, of course, because I'm such a nerd. Uh, but it's pretty old and it's kind of cobbled together and there's a million switches and actually Eve is never able to play what she wants to play when she wants to play it because there's two volume controls and there's four switches. And, um, so basically, it seems like no matter how rich you are, it's hard to consume stuff unless you go the English method and have a butler who sort of runs the house because the interfaces of all these things that you buy becomes overwhelming. And what's really natural? Should you have a phone and be typing on your phone and use your phone to control everything? Should you have wall pads and push little buttons? Or maybe again it should be voice. Why shouldn't you just sit in your living room and say, I'd like to watch TV now. Uh, I would like, you know, I'd like, I'm trying to read this book, could you please, you know, turn the reading light on? Um, you know, why isn't that the ultimate UI? And again, this is an area where I think that thoughtful application of current present day speech technology would actually yield a working system. There's some folks from Dragon Systems here today. I don't think that they would disagree with me that uh, this is buildable, but nobody's really tried because there's this belief that human beings, you know, can look at an infinite number of little LCD displays and buttons. <laughs> Okay, IP connections to facilitate customer support. So people, when people talk about the network house and everything in the home being networked, they run into skepticism sometimes because people say, well, you know, I read about this in the 60s. You know, Michael Dertuzis was talking about this in the 60s. And then in the 70s, people were talking about home net. And, you know, it just never happens. It never happens. A um, couple perspectives. First of all, most of the standards in this world were not achieved voluntarily, it seems. It looks like most of them were just hammered down people's throats by, say, the government. So all the standards in the computer industry mostly seem to arise from the federal government. So the Fed said, you know, we will have COBOL. So every computer will have a COBOL. Com every computer that we buy will have a COBOL compiler. So that resulted in sort of the first standard language. Um, and uh, then they said, well, we'll have IP and TCP. So that resulted in internet. Now the government didn't weigh in too heavily on the web, although um, they did boost the web a lot, the usage a lot in university computer science departments, I remember. A lot of faculty members didn't have websites. They said, the web sucks, I don't want to publish to a bunch of randoms. One professor, it's a friend of mine, he said, there's only 10 people in the world that I care about, you know, reading my papers and you know, why would I want to have a website? I said, well, why do you publish in journals? You know, if there's only 10 people, you've got tenure, you don't need the journal publication. If there's only 10 people that you really care about, why not just have your secretary make so 10 copies and mail them out? <laughs> <laughs> so that was the prevalent attitude, and then it changed when ARPA said, well, guess what? You're not going to get funding next year unless all your reports from last year are available at a URL. You can pick whatever URL you want, but you've got to email that to us, and that created a huge explosion of uh, university web content. Um, so this hasn't happened too much 
in the home world, and I think it's because these people don't want to disagree. I mean, you can't even use, after 50 years of 35 millimeter cameras, you can't use a Canon flash on an icon body or vice versa. Even though they're mechanically compatible, they're electrically incompatible. So the world doesn't seem to gravitate toward these standards, but I think that it's changing because it'll be cheaper to do customer support this way. I think I talk about this in a variety of places. <clears throat> but really, if you sell somebody to something now, the prices of manufacturing things is just getting lower and lower and lower. A microwave oven is now $50. If your microwave oven doesn't work and you call GE to complain about it, you know, all the profit from making that up, well, it's, you know, they had to make it in China, they had to put it on a boat or an airplane, get it into the Kmart, get it into your house. I mean, think about it. So if you call them up, and say, oh, my microwave doesn't work, you know, I can't understand it. It's much, much easier if they can say, well, we connected, we telemetered to your microwave, and, you know, you're not, it, it said that you push these three buttons, you're supposed to push these other three buttons. Um, hospital grade medical mon monitors available at consumer prices. Okay, so what does this mean? You go to the hospital oftentimes because you don't have diagnostic equipment that can see inside your body at home. I'm not sure you really want a home x ray machine. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard those are kind of dangerous. But the, um, for example, the most important machine in the hospital, the docs would tell you, is something called the uh, pulse oximeter. It says what your pulse rate is and how much oxygen is in your blood. And basically, most of the things that could lead to really serious medical problems um, will result in the oxygen level in your blood falling. Like you're up at high altitude and you get some problem with fluid in your lungs. Um, your oxygen goes down if you're under anesthesia and something's not working very well. Uh, so basically when you're in a hospital you almost always have a little cuff over your finger and it's shining a light through your skin and figuring out from the reflection of that light, I believe, uh, what your pulse is and uh, what your oxygen level is. So there's $400 pulse oximeters now. These things used to cost $20,000 or more and the price presumably from $400 is headed right down to zero. Um, so the question becomes, to what extent can you build interesting medical apps that sort of monitor you all the time, stream your data up to uh, doctors, let you do kind of um, fine-tuning of your sleeping? There's actually some guys in Belgium working on <clears throat> um, deciding if you're burnt out. This is a real important issue. I'm not sure why they don't have this issue in the MIT biology department. They have people who are, who are angry. I sat next to a guy on an airplane who's he's a technology executive behind Delta Genetics, which is a real interesting California company that publishes a database of what different genes do. So they take mice, remove a gene, and then see what goes wrong. So they say, oh, we took this gene out, and he doesn't have any retinas now. He can't see. And then they slice up the mice and take pictures of their brains and stuff and stick them into this huge Oracle database, and then they sell you a web tour through a database of all the bad things that can happen to you if you're a mouse and you're missing a gene or two. <laughs> anyway, so he's apparently an expert biologist and he was a pretty good web app conceiver, if not actual developer. PhD in biology from MIT and I said, you know, what was the biology department like? What was your grad school experience like? He said, you know, I arrived in September and I worked every waking hour, seven days a week for six years and Oh, we got into this because uh, we talked about Boston. He said he hated Boston. He never wanted to come back here. Uh, he couldn't bear to be in the city even for a conference. I said, why do you hate Boston? Because of grad school. I worked every waking hour for six years for this woman who enslaved me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, did you learn biology? And he said, yeah, <laughs> biology. But in Europe, you know, th this guy would have been considered to be at risk for burnout. They would say, you know, working every waking hour for six years in some biology lab. Uh, you know, he could be burned out. So they actually have the system that watches tiny little facial tics. So if you're getting burnt out, you could develop these facial tics. And they also want to come up with really cheap ways of measuring your cortisol levels, which is some hormone that helps you uh, metabolize energy, I guess. Uh, and if those things are uh, dropping, the system can say, hey, chill out. You know, you don't need that Nobel Prize. Um, that's a kind of interesting trend. And I think that you're going to see maybe in the next five years, a whole lot of uh, web integrated or internet integrated medical monitors. Um, you're going to see strange side effects of systems that were built in the late 20th century. So the web actually is a side effect of internet. 
in a way. It doesn't do anything really new. It piggybacks on this infrastructure that was put in um, in the 70s and the early 80s. But it took about, I don't know, 10 years after the internet was kind of a reality before the web was conceived and promulgated. And I think that you're going to see a lot of stuff like that. So for example, the GPS satellites are all, all up there now. I think the last one went up maybe about, I don't know, well, the complete set was up about five or six years ago. And they're constantly irradiating Earth with all these global positioning signals. Actually, maybe it was 10 years ago that they'll, we achieved complete 24-hour coverage. OK, so <clears throat> they're constantly uh, blasting the Earth with these radio waves. And finally, some folks thought, well, what could we learn if we flew another satellite up into space and we measured the reflections of the GPS carrier? So we could fly around in space. Maybe we could figure out ocean height, ocean salinity, temperature. Um, you could do all kinds of interesting things just relying on the fact that the Earth is being illuminated with a constant and predictable uh, 1.3 gigahertz, I think it is, or 1.1 gigahertz uh, GPS carrier. So I think that the future is all about that, is about people looking at the stuff that is already there and figuring out clever new ways to use it. All right, so learning more. Um, we just heard all this stuff. Um, we claim that we have this tools course. We have this one day tools course. Um, I don't know that we've actually done it recently. It's streaming online, um, but I really should revamp it. Uh, I haven't done enough personal work with things like Microsoft.net to do quite the one day tools course that I'd like to do. That's why there's not one tomorrow, for example. But uh, we do have these programmers weekends and boot camps where if you're a programmer but you don't know SQL and you don't know how to build a web app, you learn how to do that. It uh, looks like there's one in Washington, D.C. coming up. Berkeley, two-week boot camp in Cambridge, April 9th. They're free. This presentation, like I said, is online. Uh, if you want to wade through here, and I think you can click on my name. You can like show a list of Wimpy Point users. Um, the uh, books, uh, this one is unfinished, Building an Online Community. It should be interesting. I've never gotten organized to write down all the stuff that I just told you. But the old book is online, and it's free. So it's kind of interesting. The case studies, this shows that scorecard system, for example. Um, SQL for web nerds, this book keeps getting better about how to program SQL if you're a web nerd. Um, Ars Digita Systems Journal, this is in theory where everything that the programmers at Ars Digita and beyond who build web systems have learned goes into kind of a practical distribute knowledge acquired during the construction and operation of web-based information systems. So for example, we talked about Site 59. And here's an article on integrating travel reservations into a web service that tells you all about these um, different kinds of web systems, how you talk to them. There's the email address of the person who really knows, Curtis. Uh, I don't know, there's some other interesting things. How do you interface little PC hard, little hardware to a PC, like scientific instruments and so forth, and stream them up, or medical instruments? <clears throat> how do you do sophisticated surveys, like medical surveys that branch? You know, you can say, well, yes, I have had a heart attack, and then there's a whole bunch more questions related to that. Event planning. So d different problems. Um, multilingual web services, how to do that. A history timeline of computer science. I like this. It's not very useful, but it's fun. <clears throat> um, that usability thing I told you about, fashionable technology explained. Something about database, iMode, Oracle email, version control. Um, you can, as a last resort, read the documentation for ours digital community system. That's sort of a good idea to what you can get for free out of the box right now. Um, as a truly last resort, the strangest thing that we've ever done is ours digital university. This little motto here, never 
ever let anybody else edit anything that you've ever written. So I wrote this site originally, and now it has education for a better world up at the top. Fortunately, my name isn't on it. <laughs> anyway, um, what this is, let's just scroll past that so we don't have to look at it. Um, how about education for a worse world? Um, what this is, is an observation that there's an awful lot of people who, when they're young, want to touch the world. They want to touch human lives. So they go to college and they pick a major. And computer science was not on the list, say, back in the 80s or the 70s or the 60s, because computers were in machine rooms. They were in factories. They were in payroll check writing operations. They weren't touching human lives. Most people didn't have a computer. They didn't get near a computer. <clears throat> the, uh, that changed with the rise of the consumer web in 1994-95. Actually, uh, these days, if you want to touch human lives with a day or two of effort, writing some kind of web program or web document is probably the best way that you can do it, unless you're you know, enormously famous. I guess if you're you know, Madonna or something, you can just release another CD. But for most of us, if we want to reach a lot of people quickly, um, building some kind of web application or um, web document is a great thing to do. So we thought, OK, well, there's all these post-baccalaureate programs for people who want to go into medicine. Why not start a post-baccalaureate program for computer science? So provably, people who go through the MIT and the Stanford curriculum in computer science come out being capable of building the kinds of systems that society needs. So we thought, well, let's just take the same curriculum. Um, we'll run it in one year. So we'll take you know the kind of middle two years of undergraduate program and mush it all into one year, which is pretty easy to do because you know at Stanford and MIT students are they're young, they have to learn about humanities and science and all these other different topics because and, and also they have to learn about you know how to grow up from a 19 year old into a 20 year old or whatever. But so we thought, okay, let's um, let's run this for uh, people who already have college degrees. Let's do it in a year, one course at a time. And let's do it in a big room like this so that if they have trouble, they can always ask for help from another student <coughs> who's working on the same problem. Whereas at MIT, we give them a problem set. We tell them to go home. If they have bad study habits and it's due in the morning, the night before the problem set's due, they usually can't get any help 